Hello, everyone. My name is Preston Dennett, and welcome to a new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I've got a very exciting episode for you today. I'm going to continue my series of interviews with Dolly Safran, who is the main witness to my book, Symmetry, A True UFO Adventure. As you may know, I have done three previous interviews with her. Today is part four, and I call it Interview with a Fully Conscious UFO Contactee, part four, planets, or rather worlds, I have seen. And uh, the, free, the three previous episodes, part one was the awakening, and that talked about how Dolly woke up to UFO contact and her experiences all the way up to age 14. Part two was called the photographic evidence, and that presents a lot of the photos and films that Dolly has been able to capture and uh, that helped validate her experiences. And part three was extraterrestrials I have met. So part four today continues this series, and I think you'll benefit from watching these in order. This one will certainly stand alone. I really wanted to do this episode today because I think it shows some of the more exciting aspects of Dolly's relationship with the ETs and the many adventures she has had. And we did cover some of these in the book Symmetry, but I'm sure we're going to learn some new stuff today because that always happens every time I talk to Dolly. <laughs> so Dolly, I really want to thank you for joining me today. Um, it's a huge mm -hmm. honor. Thank you. You're welcome. My pleasure. I'm excited because, uh, yeah, I've talked to other people who've seen other worlds. Uh, as you know, I did talk to a gentleman by the name of Jay Gardner, contacted from West Virginia, who had an experience pretty much identical to yours being taken to Saturn as a young kid. And we did cover all of this stuff in part one. So I really wanted to talk about some of the other worlds that we haven't really had a chance to talk about on air yet. And uh, one that really intrigues me is because you actually got to land and walk on the surface was this small rocky world, if I remember correctly, with a lighter gravity that was somewhat nearing the end of its life cycle. Is that correct? Yes, yes. it was a, a planet in a solar system in our galaxy that um, it was heading in toward its uh, star and its uh, gravity was um, being uh, lightened somewhat. It was a planet that was starting to lose mass because it was heating up and water was disappearing. It was getting hotter there every day. It's out gassing. And um, so I got to see the end of the, the beginning of its end of life cycle. Um, it would have reached a point when it got too close to the sun that everything would have burned up. It would have had molten uh, issues with lava and volcanic eruptions and things like that. And they wanted me to see really close to the end of that cycle so we actually landed and uh, we got to walk around a little bit uh the uh, we had breathing apparatus because the air was really bad and um it was kind of interesting it was extremely hot and i it, it taught me a huge lesson that our planets are volatile that they any change in distance from the sun, its size, anything can cause this planet to go through unbelievably cataclysmic uh, situations. And this one was right there. And that's why I went. It was very cool. So about how old were you? Mm, I was young. I was uh, flying. I was learning to fly. And I was probably 22, 23, somewhere around there, still making my way through the galaxy, pretty much learning all the ins and outs of approaching planets and systems and knowing where I was. It was a journey of discovery, but it was also a journey for me to learn about how incredibly diverse and our systems are and, and how each one follows a certain pattern of birth, life, and death. And that was my journey at that time. All right, so you went down with a group of people and grades as well? Yes. Uh huh. Uh, um, we were with Talata, and there were probably 30 people who went down. Um, there was probably um, five of us were um, Earth human, and the rest were either grays or tall whites. It was a mix, and we were all students, and we were learning. 
Well, so was this uh, a, an hour long trip or did you stay? No, we time? were there. It took about, uh, it took about, I don't know, about a half an hour to land. And then, it, then we're stasis for a while. We can't come out. It's even too dangerous for us to exit the craft when we're flying like that. It's got a lot of radiation around it. It's very hot. So we have to cool down. We have to evacuate um, what's around it, you know, give us a chance to get down ramp. Uh, then we, we proceed to do that. And there's like protocols uh, for what we do. We stay in a group. We stay with, we have buddy system, that kind of thing. We're all monitored the whole time we're out. And uh, we were probably two and a half hours out. And uh, we had a way to shade ourselves. And we had eye gear on and um, breathing apparatus. And uh, we collected, um, it's not just a, oh, let's go look. It's a scientific expedition as well. They're curious about everything. So we took samples of things. Everything is um, uh, making sure that uh, we understand the science of this as well as they know the science of that particular planet. In other words, they're watching it de-evolve and uh, they want to know everything. So we helped with that, actually. So it was pretty cool. And so there's life on this planet, like trees, I mean, yeah, animals. Sort of, yes, what was left, and there was some animal life left. We took samples of everything. Um, it was mostly insectoid. Um, a type of, you know, amphibious, lizardy kind of things, not water ones, but, you know, iguana type of things, weird looking stuff. Um, there were spiders, there were flies, um, there were just all kinds of things, gnats, you name it. Um, they were dying out at this point. We saw a lot of carcasses and stuff like that. But yeah, it was pretty, pretty messed up there. Were the trees like we would look at here, pine trees and oak trees and birch and so forth? Um, it was more like desert plants that were being left. Uh, there were dead trees everywhere. Um, like the area that I was at would have had a, a very nice pine forest, but they were all dead by then. Um, they were just the carcass of trees, you know, just falling over, desiccating, that kind of thing. Um, there was some upheaval of the ground, you know, they would have uh, earthquakes and things and the earth would open up in certain places. And so we saw some of that. Um, we were in an area where we had a big level plane to walk around on, but you could see off in the distance, you know, things that were going wrong. And um, they were monitoring the entire time that we were there because they were worried about us being in a situation that would have caused us to have to run. And uh, so it was a real tight fit for us to be there for a while. Um, was the sky blue? No, no, <laughs> <laughs> no. It was uh, burnt uh, brownish oranges red color maybe yellows you know a lot a lot of very bad vapors in the air no real cloud formations but it it was very dense with dust and pollution and stuff like that you know earth pollution but there it, it is an oxygen planet or was it was an oxygenated planet yeah any planet that holds life like we know it is going to have a certain mix of oxygen and nitrogen on it and other elements as well like we do um that's the only way life is sustainable. We're carbon based. We have DNA. We we need water. We need nitrogen. We need salt. That kind of thing. And any plant that planet that supports life is going to have those parameters. And it's like that through the entire universe. So what about the sun? Was it like here on Earth when you just look up at the sky and see the sun? Um, yeah, it was blinding as I'll get at. When I said we had protective eye gear on, I'm not kidding. We didn't just have lenses over our eyes. We had um, like little goggly kind of things that were very thick and it was bright. I mean, bright. The closer you get to a sun, the brighter it gets and the heat's intense. I mean, you could feel it all over you. We were wearing outfits that kind of blocked that, you know, protected us. You, you know, like we have fire uh, wear that firemen wear. It's like shiny. That's the type of suits that we were wearing to protect us from it. Oh, wow. Yeah. So you stayed there for a couple of hours. Two hours, yeah. Yeah, total, probably total three because it's half an hour to 45 minutes to cool down to get out. And then we have to get back on. And then he has to regenerate the engine and get us going. On a planet that's like that, it's a little bit more difficult because we're using twice the power just to get out. You know, the electricity required is very, very high. And so it takes them a minute to rev up the um, battery power at that point until they hit the nuclear part of the engine. And then once they do that, boom, we're out and they go straight up. So, uh, yeah. So how, was the gravity lighter than Earth? 
Yes. Um, it wasn't like the moon, like I couldn't jump 20, 30 feet, but it was lighter. I could tell it was lighter, although it was harder to breathe, you know, um, even wearing uh, apparatus that we can breathe, it, you feel suppressed somewhat, you know, because it's it's difficult. You know, you know, you're breathing contained air that you're breathing from an apparatus um, and you worry more about it. It goes in your brain and you're thinking, hmm, OK, breathe, <laughs> take the breath, let it out, take the breath. I mean, the whole time I was there, I was thinking that it's like going on a dive. You know, don't forget to breathe. <laughs> don't. It was like that. So did, could you smell anything? Um, you could taste it. Um, when you're on a breathing apparatus, it's, uh, you're breathing the air in the can okay but if you open your mouth you can it comes through and you can actually taste it and it goes to your olfactory nerve and it's very burnt up very dried i've been in arizona now so i know what that smells like <laughs> burn arizona up a couple more hundred times and that would be it you know it's very burnt up smelly so and was this like the only planet in the sol in that solar system or no it... no this system had 13 planets actually most of them were gas giants. This was a smaller planet and it was closer in. It's funny, there's a there's a pattern in solar systems where there are smaller uh, planets near to the star and then there's a lot of gas giants and then other sizes mixed in between. Mm -hmm. um, and this was one of four that was close into the sun and this was the second one to the sun. It was way further out of it, but it was going in. I think about it as our past. I wonder how far out Mercury was in the beginning and how long it took it to get sucked in by the sun. And I think that's what I was being taught, okay? That the first three planets, Mercury, Mars, Venus, I mean, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, were the first four, okay? And I think Venus and Mercury were brought closer in over time while we were evolving in a solar system. And that's what I was being taught. Yeah, well, that's basic scientific theory. In fact, there's many astronomers who believe that there was, in fact, a planet closer to the sun than Mercury. Right, and absorbed Something. it. Correct. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, that was some, so this planet was in what scientists would call the Goldilocks zone or the sweet spot, where it's yeah. perfect for life to evolve or to right. live, I should say. Yeah. All right. So, very cool. Just one. Last thing on that. So the life you saw like lizards and smaller animals and insects were these like you'd see on Earth or completely different or like, did they have nine legs or you know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> most, most, you know, there's a there's a uh, pattern, you know, uh, there's a pattern mathematically and they know that everything's going to have four of something. OK, very few things have six or eight. Arachnids have eight. Um, flies have four, that kind of thing. Um, even six, there's some with six, but they're mostly insectoid. Um, if it has uh, blood in its veins, it's going to have a f two front and two back, you know, or be bipedal like we are, two arms and two legs. And uh, so they're mostly four limbed. Um, some of them have really fat round tails that absorb uh, fluid, you know, in other words, like a camel. I saw some that looked like I, I wanted to call them camel lizards because they were dragging this big ass tail around tail around that was full of fluid and it was surviving. You know, it's how it survived. If it found water, it drank its tail full. That freaked me out because I've never seen a lizard like that on Earth ever. There's a few salamanders like that. And even if you look at a platypus, they've got that big tail and I know it's, you know, capable of holding fluid. So, yeah. Oh, a platypus. Yeah. yeah. Oh, we won't get into the platypus. That's alien in itself. <laughs> okay. um, so, were there? Do you know if there were ever humans or you know sentient life as we would think of it on that planet? Um, I never thought of to ask that question, and I've thought about it since then. And they said no. Uh, it was an evolving planet that they knew would never have enough time for them to plant or seed, and it was decided not to even try to just let it go, let it do what it was going to do. So life was uh, very, very simple there you know, very uh, smaller animals, lesser developed animals, that kind of thing. So, yeah. I only got to visit that once. Yeah, yeah, it was gone pretty oh. shortly after that. So. so it's pretty, I mean, you know, we talk about this in the book, but it's pretty rare that you get to actually land down and walk on the surface of another planet as opposed to getting to visit one and look out through the windows at it. Yeah, <laughs> so no, I, I've landed on a lot of planets. I mean, our galaxy's full 
of uh, habitable planets and they actually know um, as many of them as they could possibly know and they visit them regularly. Part of my training as a pilot flying with them was to go to different worlds and uh, learn the process of contact with them. Most of the ones I went to were known contact. In other words, they knew who we were. They knew what it was all about. They're very well evolved, beautiful people, different peoples. Um, here, we're just sort of backward. I think there's only three other planets that I'm aware of in the in our galaxy that are kind of slow learners, and we're one of them. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that doesn't surprise me. Yeah. Um, so, did that planet have a name? And if it did, can you share it? Um, I would have to speak their language to name it for you. Uh, I've thought really long and hard about this, and um, no, I'm not going to tell us. I don't even waste my time because um, I can't give you their language. It's um, we're, we've learned to uh, our governments have learned to use machines that make them psychic. They're not enabling their own abilities. They're using AI to do it. And um, although AI can do it and does, they have AI that is psychic. That's where they got that technology from. They don't want to give out uh, languages yet because we don't need to know them. Not yet. So. Which speaks to what slow learners we are in terms of at least. <laughs> yeah, well, good mimics. It's whole growth. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's like you don't give a jet engine to your child, okay? Right. They're gonna cause havoc with it, with themselves and everybody else around that engine. So no, I'm not gonna give you the name. No. All right. So okay. we did talk a lot about you know the Gray's home world already, uh, or you know they live and you spent a lot of time on there. That's really cool. But Another planet we did talk about in the book was sort of a water world. And I think yes. you got to visit that a number of times and there's actually people on that planet. Yes. So I wonder if you could talk about you know, that world that you have seen and some of the adventures and studies okay. you did with that. Okay, this is a world that actually people on this planet know about, they've been taught. Um, and it would be Polynesia, the Polynesian peoples know about this world. It is what they consider their home world. And it is not in uh, the Pleiades, it's beyond the Pleiades. In other words, it's in this galaxy, but if you were to go through, head toward Orion and go up through the Pleiades and go past them deeper into our galaxy, it would be right back at the Pleiades in that system. And um, it is in the system of Delphi, which is, if you're looking at a 3D, or 40 or 70 map of something, you could see that the Delphi system would be, high, be further beyond the Pleiades. And um, it is a water world. It has land mass on it, but not as much as it's got water. And there are two types of um, peoples living there. One of them actually live in the water and they are uh, not amphibious. They're m mammals like we are. They're a type of humanoid they're humanoid, they have DNA human like we do, but they've evolved in the water and they're very, very intelligent. They also have bigger brains than we do and they have extra hemispheres in their brains that we don't have, okay? That's how smart they are. Um, they're fully psychic, they're fully able to manipulate their environment around them and um, it's interesting to know them. Um, but I spent a lot of time on the land masses and they're very Polynesian. Um, there's a girl there that I stayed with when I was on this planet because I got to stay for a month at a time when I went and her name was Nietzsche and she's my age and uh, she helped educate me to their way of life. In other words, she showed me that evolution doesn't mean you have to have a constructed world around you, that uh, infrastructure is not as important as your inner mind and your inner ability and your inner knowledge that knowledge outweighs any infrastructure you could put on the ground. Living sustainably and in, in a, an environment healthy is their way of living. Although they're extremely intelligent and they can do almost anything they want to. Um, they are interdimensional flight flyers. They can, if they choose to, those that live on the world full time prefer to be there, but they're, they're scientists, they're artists. They do many, many, many things, but they manipulate and are, have evolved to the point that um, you really don't need a piece of paper or they remember. 
They're fully in contact with what consciousness really is, and that's who they are. They just have a physical form still, and they're very beautiful. And anybody in Polynesia will tell you that they're gorgeous. They're absolutely gorgeous, and that's where they came from. Our people. That's some of them, the Polynesian people here. All right. So yeah. are they like how? Uh, do they have blonde hair and red hair and dark hair and the whole range? Mostly they have uh, the darker hair. They look very dark. Um, they're not, um, they're um, what you would call like a tan brown color, their, their skin. They spend a lot of time outdoors and, you know, they've got a lot of melanin going on. They have darker eyes. They have hazel eyes, brown eyes, black eyes, that kind of thing. Um, they, uh, they, they have... Some peoples have more than 32 or 36 teeth in their mouth. They have closer to like 42. And um, they're more, uh, they have more of the sharp teeth, you know, the incisor type of teeth, like the first four in the front, almost like a cat, but not really. It's, they got a lot of sharp teeth in their mouth. And that's because they eat food um, raw and stuff like that. They'll eat fish raw. They'll eat um, certain types of meat, you know, that way the cook things too but it's mostly raw food is what they eat and they need those teeth for that they can crunch as well as spears um do they speak telepathically yes they do they have a language um it sounds like hawaiian to me <laughs> when i hear it um that's why her name is micha and uh it's really, really cool. She tried to teach me her language, but I have way too much going on in my head language wise from here. And I, at, when I first met her, I was learning gray language and it screwed with me. So I just said, nah, I know a few words. Let's put it that way. I do have something in common with her, though. I am part of that bloodline. I have Asian and I have Japanese. I have South Korean. I have uh, um Korean blood, I have Polynesian East East Asian blood lines in me. And um and my name that they call me is that from that world and it's Oora. And oh. when they came, there's places that they came to on, on this planet, several, and my name originates from that. So with them. So yeah. So when you say this is a water world, we're talking just uh, like a saltwater ocean? Yes, salt water. Okay. Yep, absolutely. They yeah. do have land masses where there's fresh water. You gotta have fresh water to survive. Humans can't drink salt water at all, but they have the technology to desalinate as well, so it's not a problem. So. Yeah, they're, they're in regular contact with the ETs on a yes. constant, ongoing basis. Yes. Right. All right. And uh, what's the biggest land mass? I mean, there's, you said there's lots of little islands. How big are we talking? Um, well, one of the land masses is probably as big as Australia. That's probably the biggest one. And then everything from that falls smaller and smaller and smaller. I asked when I first saw this planet, you know, why? Why is there more water on this world? And they just said that's the way this planet evolved. It was in a system where there was more water available to come down on the planet when it was being formed. And it, it's, in a, it's in a place where more water is coming from outer space into it as well. You don't realize it, but this planet gets water from outer space every day. Okay. Yep. And uh, so this planet's in a really wet area, and so they get a lot of ice and water coming to it. That's why. Yeah, yeah, I heard about our, our own asteroids. The whole asteroid belt has a lot of water in it. Yes, absolutely. Ice, a yes. recent scientific discovery. Right. Water is much more common than people realize. Exactly. <laughs> so, it's, one of the, it's one of the basics of life, period. Yeah. So there's not a whole lot of freshwater planets out there, would you say? Um, yeah, it, every planet that's habitable in the habitable zone and it's, you know, joined itself together to be a habitable planet would have tons and tons of water on it one way or the other. Our planet has tons and tons of water. Yeah, Very few in planets terms of oceans. Don't. What, say again? In terms of oceans and seas. They all have oceans and they all have seas and they all have fresh water on them. Every single planet I've ever seen has yeah, water. But, but the oceans are generally salt water would that be fair? yes there's a yeah that's one of the the basics of life every kind of type of rock produces some kind of basalt salt okay and uh, the oceans are pretty much really ha heavily salinated life begins in even with us we're born in saltiness and that's one of the requirements of life all right so this water world would again be in the goldilocks zone 
you know, three yes. planets out. <laughs> yeah. Is that how yeah. it usually is? Um, uh, the one that I was on with Micha was actually fifth planet out. It's oh. a much bigger planet. Um, it's bigger than Earth. It's twice the size of Earth. It is not tidal locked. It does revolve. It has uh, uh, a semi-season going around. And um, yeah, it's 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 different, but the same. You know, the different parameters of things, but it all falls into the same Goldilocks type of life going on. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because I think there's some mis misconceptions about the size of a planet and the gravity it has. Right. Really, gravity is more based on you know, your connection to the sun and how distant Correct. it is from the sun. Would right, that... how fast your planet revolves. Uh, centrifugal force um, and the weight of the planet will give you a heavier weight. Okay, Earth is very dense and it moves pretty fast. I mean, we have one day, okay, cycle of turning. That makes us pretty gravity heavy. We're still close enough for the sun for it to not be as heavy as we could be, but yeah, it's very gravity heavy because we're moving like gangbusters. There are some planets that have two and three day cycles that revolve much slower and the gravity is lighter because of that. And it, the larger the planet and the less it revolves, well, th there's still, there's numbers that go in. It, it's like, you know, when you dial up the sound and you've got the woofers and the tweeters and all of that, well, gravity is kind of like that on a planet. It, it depends on the size, the mass, which would be most of the size, how fast it's revolving and how close it is to its planet, and whether it's tilted or not, whether it's doing, if, if it's tidal locked or whatever, it's a lot of math is going into figuring out what this planet's gravity would be. It's all different, all of it. How big its core is. And yes. Yeah. So this water planet, which was the fifth planet, would be a little bit farther out than Earth, but it, and. Yeah, uh, it's a bigger planet. Yeah, way bigger, twice the size of Earth. So um, what, Earth what, is a kind what, of a medium sized planet from what I've seen in my travels, okay? It's it not a giant planet at all. Bigger than Earth then? Yes, it's about to bigger, twice the size of Earth. Yeah. The gravity, the gravity. Oh, it's actually less because its day is longer. It, it moves slower. It revolves slower and it has a little bit less gravity. This is the heaviest gravity planet I've ever, I was born here, so I'm used to it, but I've been other places now where the gravity is much lighter. And Earth did have a lighter gravity before all, you know, what broke loose eons ago, you know, 280 million years ago, 250 million years ago, bad things happened and it, it sped us up, threw us into a different, uh, smaller, weirder, tighter orbit, and it made us grab very gravity heavy. Those animals that lived on Earth, the, the, the um, dinosaurs, all of them were much bigger. Plants were bigger, trees were bigger, less gravity at that time. Now we're very gravity heavy. Yeah. We're also a little bit closer to the sun. Humanoids are bigger, the giants on Earth. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and now we're not super well suited for Earth. There's a lot of scientific research toward, right. towards that. Like right. everyone's got low back pain. We've got problems, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so this water planet had lots of life on it. Uh, that tons, tons. Yep, every so, kind of life you could possibly imagine. The life that's on this planet is replicated here. They brought a lot of their flora and their fauna with them when they brought people here, okay, um, and put them here. Um, they have palm trees. They have uh, certain kinds of, you know, papaya. They have a poi, um, poi. You know what poi is made out of? And those plants, um, ginger, things like that. All of those came from that world. They brought them here for these people. To, to enjoy. They didn't want them to be without what they were sustainably used to. Um, every people that came to this planet were put in uh, zones of, of um, ecology, you know, e ecological areas where we were going to survive according to um, how we were uh, used to it, what our DNA was scripting us to be comfortable in. And that's how we all came out here. That's why there's so many ethnicities of us. We're all the same genome. We're all human beings. We're identical, as a matter of fact, but we have ethnicity issues. We're darker, lighter. We, some of us have bigger lungs. Just It's just different. We dime out differently from different environments. And they were providing us with sustainable environments to live in. So on that water world, do they have lions and tigers and bears? No, they have lots of monkeys and birds and ground-dwelling things. And I've seen rats and I've seen chickens and I've seen... Um, uh, big birds, you know, and uh, 
uh, prey birds and things like that, and seagulls. Oh my God, they got seagulls and big seagulls. Uh, uh, boobies, you know, flat-footed boobies were there, and blue-footed boobies and albatrosses and all kinds of stuff. They had everything. I mean, you name it, they had it. And it's unbelievably lush with life, all different kinds of life, different plants, you know, everything. You name it, they got it. And you visited there multiple times, is that right? Yes. Yeah, I've spent a lot of time there. Yeah. I became very, very good friends with Micha. She and I are connected and I can remote to her and and we do have conversations from time to time she's my age she's a month older now too oh, wow. and, yeah so would time flow differently there i mean if you were to like be, spend three years here on earth and go back to there would it be three years passing there if it's um we don't they don't think of time like we do they don't pass time like we do they're living 3d like we are they're in a t a, 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 a gravity intense uh timeline but they gave up thinking about it that way. In other words, um, your day begins when there's light and your day ends when there's dark and you rest when it's dark. And so they don't mark time the same way do, we do. Um, they have, uh, as a matter of fact, when I met Micha, I thought I was older, but I wasn't. She told me that we were probably the same age. I'm taller than Micha and um, she's uh, shorter than I am. I uh thought she was just younger. I don't know if you can answer this, but do they live longer there? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, wow. they do. They have better health. They're not polluting their bodies. They're not eating the wrong things. They're not stressing themselves out with negativity. And uh, they live very good lives there. And they, yes, they live a long time. Very long lived. So like, like 800 what? years or more. Yes. Oh, yeah. And we have gotten gypped. That's terrible. All right. No, I feel really short lived. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Goodness gracious. OK, um, so what else can I ask about this planet? You visited there from when you were a kid all the way up through adulthood. Yes. That yes. The yeah. last time I was there, um, shortly before I became pregnant with my daughter, and that's the last time I was there. And uh, when I became pregnant, they uh, banned me from too much travel. And then once I was a mother here, um, I had to, I was traveling here, but I wasn't going through the universe like I wanted to. Yeah. All right. Very cool. Very cool. Another thing we covered in the book, which I thought would be fun to go over because it was so dramatic, was they took you to a planet that was ending its life cycle. Yeah. And ultimately was destroyed and you got to visit this i think it was four or five times over a period of years yeah i was very young the first time i saw it. i was like 10 and uh, they took me to a world um we didn't land on it uh we went very close we went into its atmosphere um it was in a twin star system and the planet was uh, devolving because the sun was because it was being eaten by its twin and oh. uh it was swelling up and getting bigger and bigger and bigger like a red dwarf star okay and it was it was literally eating into its own solar system and this planet was uh, losing its life it was going into that and so i saw the beginning of it they were had evacuated everybody off this planet because there was life living on it they actually had a population of people and uh they were thousands of years in the process of getting everything gone and now uh, we were going to visit it. It was like a science experiment. We we're noting the the evolution of this planet in this system by this star that was being eaten by another one, and uh, it was really cool. <laughs> the first time I saw it, there were still plants and and stuff on it, but it looked bad and it was very dark. Their dates it it became tidal locked as a result of what was happening to it, and one side of the planet was already burning off, and then the other half was just slowly dying in the cold and it was dark and cold and i saw mountain ranges and i saw trees and i saw all kinds of stuff but it was just it was gonna die you could tell it was so, all around when you say tidal locked that means one side is facing the sun right it quit it quit revolving okay it was going down its magnetosphere was going it its poles couldn't regenerate you know magnetism changes on a planet that's being annihilated by a red dwarf and it slows the planet down until it stops revolving and then it 
it's about to be eaten massively eaten all at one time and uh, it comes apart it literally it, it expands just like the sun is turning into a red dwarf the planet loses its cohesion and everything starts bubbling up and becomes molten and it burns and so i saw the beginning of that and uh, went back several times marking its you know continued progress in this it takes a long time what we think should happen overnight takes a long time <laughs> universe moves at a different pace than we think and um so you were watching the forests burn up and the lakes completely yes, boil away it's just and being yeah it's just being taken out you can see water going up i'm not kidding you it's really cool um as i got older i know about this planet i was watching it um i would be given updates by talata he would show me mentally show me what was going on because they were constant contact with it and then in 2018 this is so weird to me my father passed away in 2018 january the 2nd and i was very forlorn and they said you're going to have a joy this year i want you to know it i'm like okay he said do you remember seeing a supernova when you were younger i was in my 20s and and i said yeah and he said guess what you get to see it now they had taken me back in time to watch it nova 60 million light years from here okay and i got to see it in real time supernova here we saw the light of it finally get to earth and i got to watch it again that blew my mind that helped me somehow it was Yeah. Very poignant. Yeah. So this is something that we actually captured on the Hubble t telescope. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this this is amazing, and I think it speaks towards how advanced these beings truly are to be yes. able to yeah. uh, take you there to see something live that actually occurred in the past. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So you went there for the last final sort of thing. I got to see it way back in. Yeah, we were close enough that it wouldn't harm us because when things go supernova, gamma radiation is unbelievably bad. We made sure that we were shielded enough and uh, we got to witness it and we got the heck out of Dodge as fast as we could. We, we in other words, we did a jump. We did a light jump where we went through a door, you know, a, a dimensional doorway. We came in, watch it, we got out. And it was spectacular. I mean, it was just, um, you don't even know that light's about to pop off. And it's brilliant. You can feel a pressure from it. There's a pressure wave with it. And uh, just before the pressure wave got on us, we were gone. But I could feel it coming. I mean, I could actually feel it coming. It made me sick to my stomach. I was like, oh my God, you know, this is incredible. And then we didn't have anything open. We saw the light right through the skin of the craft. In other words, the whole craft lit up and. So did this planet by that point, was it just completely pulverized and in pieces? Yes, it was already gone. The sun ate it. It totally, um, what's the word? Absorbed it, desiccated it, it was gone. Yeah. It became part of its atmosphere is what it did. So it was looking for fuel. <laughs> so there's life throughout the universe. Yes. Um, it basically, as you've mentioned, follows a template. And so this is ultimately why we decided to call the book Symmetry. Yes. Was, um, yeah. Can you speak a little bit about, you know, how there, there is symmetry to life throughout the universe? Yes. Um, we live in a universe that's uh, got several aspects to it. The first one is, is that it's got a hard uh, drive like a computer. In other words, it's 3D. It's very gravity heavy. It's its mainframe. It has planets. It has stars. It has all kinds of chemical compositions in it. It's just the mainframe of life. Like your body is your mainframe. Okay. Our universe is like that heavy duty mainframe in 3D. It, it exists in the third dimension totally. Within that dimension, within that mainframe, there are 12 total dimensions of of uh, existence is the only way I can explain that each level of existence in this mainframe is a different uh, window into the next one. In other words, while you and I are sitting here talking, 
I can tell you that there are other beings existing with us as uh, interdimensional beings who live in exactly the same space with us. And it's planet wide, it's universe wide. Everywhere in the universe are 12 dimensions, one on top of the other. The higher the dimensions you are able to go, the more you can see. They can see us. We're not using our pineal glands. We're not, we're not using our ability to see them energetically, okay? Our consciousness knows they're there, that we do see them from time to time without realizing it. That's what we sometimes think specters are, ghosts or whatever. Some people are, when they pass away, are still hanging out. We can see them too, but there are other dimensional beings with us. They're just like us. They evolve through this universe just like us and we're doing, and it's very, very cool. All right, that's cool. Yes. So at some point, everyone reaches out into the third dimension and goes through the that and moves onward <laughs> or upward or outward. Yeah, they're, they're <laughs> oh, well, there's way more than that also. I mean, in our universe, we have parallel universes with us. There are more than one, and we're all sort of together. And there are multiple universes within this universe, dimensionally speaking. It's all the same universe, okay, our dimensions. But there are those that are aligned with us, I mean, infinitely aligned in each one. Um, I was taught that um, we are energy, we are thought, we are light, and we're conscious light. And we're all together in what they consider to be the uh, best word for it is source. We're all together in this energetic space. And we come here to these bodies to experience and understand and learn and un know how to use the knowledge that we all have innately as entities uh, in source. We know everything there. Um, it makes us mature. It makes us elevate consciously in other words we become smarter wiser 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 and the more you're able to do with your consciousness the more you learn and know and expand your conscious mind you can evolve and we will eventually be able to go up to some other level other than what we're perceiving now i think that we consciously push out not just to this universe but to others around us i think we can live simultaneously we're capable of it in many different and we move around through that so if we have like this kind of a, a tangent but we have i don't know seven eight billion people on this planet um, thereabouts yeah is that normal <laughs> yeah <laughs> to have that many people on a planet um mm, we're kind of overpopulated um nine million or billion uh, nine billion is excessively i think it's between seven and eight and a half okay it fluctuates and yes, it's too many. We're, we're living unsustainably. We haven't learned the art of controlling our population, of controlling uh, how we exist with one another. And that's a big deal. And so in that water world, how many people would you estimate, or do you know, are living on that where Micha is? Probably around three to four million people total. And it's a much bigger planet. So that's and you know, a billion. Huh? Million, million or million? Million. All right. They do not. They do not. So generally speaking. Garner their numbers. When you live a long time, you don't need to have 50 kids. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> That's not the deal. If you're going to live a long time. You need to re realize that if you keep having children, you're going to use up all your resources. You're going to use up all your time and you're not going to evolve in the way that you need to learn and do things and understand things. Parenthood is a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. And they regard parenthood as um, one of the greatest challenges there are actually, but they don't overuse it. In other words, they've learned to garner that uh, impulse. Do they have pets like dogs and cats yep. on the world? <laughs> yep, 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 yep. They have they very good at animal husbandry, and they're very good at uh, plants. They're gardeners. They're uh, wise beyond belief in their caretaking of their environments. You you have to because this is your this is your home world. This is where you exist. And even though you can go other places, you still have to take care of where you live. You have to use it as uh, responsibly as you possibly can because it sustains you. So there are humans and greys and mantids yep. and blue yep. beings and short humanoids and whales and dolphins and all of it. Yes. All right. And giraffes and hippos <laughs> and, and all kinds of neat looking things you've never seen before. Yes. 
all, all over. Universe. Teeming with life. Teeming, yes. Okay, so another thing that I found really interesting was uh, you got the opportunity on a number of occasions to visit like huge motherships with animal husbandry centers and arboretums and what we here on Earth call theoretically Dyson spheres, which yes. are artificial planetoids. So these are real. Right. Yes, they exist. Um, they are uh, the one that I've been on. I've been on. I've been to one several times. It's the same one. Um, it's much bigger than Earth, and it actually revolves. It has a, you know, spin to it, and they move it from system uh, systems with a star, so that it can get within that star's uh, gravitational field just enough to hang out there for a while till they move it again. And it's quite the thing to move one. They pretty much leave them where they put them. And it has to be a system that will allow it, physically allow it into that system to stay. Um, they're huge and they contain life that is a way station. In other words, uh, if I'm gonna go completely across the universe to a system out there on the other side, I need some place to hold up and take a break and rest, repair, whatever, before I move on. Jumping interdimensionally is not as easy as it seems. People are like, oh, I just poop. No, you're physically affected by it. Like anything electromagnetic, anything where you're using energy physically affects you. Every time I fly with ET, I become unbelievably exhausted and I have to take breaks. And uh, everybody else does too. Being in space is horrifically dangerous because you're in line with gamma radiation like you can't even imagine. And we have to, we hop so that we're protected. And this planetoid protects us. It has its own magnetosphere because it's just revolving. They put it into a situation where it's able to do that, okay? And it creates its own core. It has an energy core in it, just like a planet that produces the magnetosphere. They have graviton uh, wave technology. Their technology is billions of years more advanced than ours. And it's very, very, very cool. So it's an artificial situation that they mock as natural a situation as they possibly can. It's quite the feat. And well, that brings me to my next question, because if I could design a world, boy, the things I would do. So is this, I mean, like like a garden inside? Very. Yeah, it's got everything. It's got oceans. It's got um, uh, mountains, kind of, sort of. Um, it's got lakes, big lakes, you know, freshwater lakes. It has. Um, uh, places where they can grow food on the outside of it. They have that ability. Um, they have uh, big mechanical uh, engineering places where when a craft flies in and it needs to be, have something done to it or the, the indwelt pilot, the co or the main pilot, I'm a co-pilot. The main pilot needs to get off and go do his own thing and he needs to rest because you can't, you still expend energy. There's, you don't get something for nothing. You're going to use energy up. When Talata and I went, he had to get off that craft. He had to go be who he is and rest as well as I did. And uh, it's very, it's, so they have every situation you could possibly think of to handle whoever's on that craft for whatever reason. So we have our crafts are being repaired, re, 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 replenished with things that we need to travel and do whatever missions that we're on, that kind of thing. We have animals, plants that are being moved th throughout the universe that it's a way station for them. It's a place for them to stay there until they decide where this is going to go and what they're going to utilize it for. They have huge uh, places where they do investigating uh, interpreting of how how well this genome is working, how well that genome is working, plant-wise or animal-wise, and they do animal husbandry on these sometimes. They'll like you know let let's let's genetically shore this one up. You know we got some genetic drift going here. Let's you know fix right. it up a little bit. Let's help it regain its cohesive genetic uh, ability to live and grow and thrive wherever it's at and that kind of thing. So it's a pretty cool place. But just to clarify, when we're talking about a Dyson sphere or planetoid, as, as they would call them, I guess, uh, is, this, is this hollow with a, like a gumball? Um, I mean, with a, well, with they this, live inside this. it as, yeah, they, all these things that they've got going on are inside it as well as on the surface of it. There's not a lot on the surface of it because 
the magnetosphere that they produce on this is not as large as a regular planet, okay? So it's mostly inside and they have the lighting for it and that kind of thing. They can generate incredible energy on the inside. They can make enough uh, UV uh, radiation for things to grow and things on the inside. So when you're in it, it looks like you're on a planet, on the surface yeah, of a planet. Yeah, you feel like you're outside, you bet, yep. Wow, and when you're coming, what does it look like from the outside? Um, when I approach, when we're coming into it, um, it's uh, actually has some uh, reflective, you know, it reflects whatever's around it, but it mostly, it takes on the color of like a blue-green color, you know, on the outside, it's shiny like that, but then it's kind of matte where they're growing stuff on the outside of it, and they actually have a body of water, there's ice, that kind of thing, ice develops on them in certain places, the poles, they have poles like we do on our planet and stuff like that. It's very cool. So is this it's very brilliant to look at it? Is this metallic in its frame framing, I guess, with earth and stone built around it, so to speak? Um, it's incorporated. The materials that they use are natural materials on the inside and then man made or, you know, uh, reconstructed things that they've brought in that'll coexist in that particular type of space with that kind of gamma radiation coming at it, you know? And um, so it's, it's, it changes. They redo things all the time. I mean, it's not a set thing that's like this forever. They're constantly reworking on this. They're constantly rebuilding it. They're constantly doing that sort of thing. It's an evolving thing that you can't, you can't not do it. Things wear out, you have to replenish, that kind of thing. Are these rare or do they have a lot of Yes, them? they're rare. There aren't that many of them that I know of. I know of the one that I've been on and I know of three others. And uh, they're placed strategically in the universe. So, yeah. All right. And can they hold? I mean, <laughs> I imagine it can hold a lot of people. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can get lost in there. Um, I would put it as... Um, at any given time, there's probably, oh, I'm thinking about this really hard. It's probably maybe close to about a million people on one at any given time, simultaneously, yeah. All right, well, that's and not- constantly are moving back and forth. What? Is that, that many compared to how many people we have here? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. It's amazing, they can, they, Think about it, there are trillions and trillions and zillions and I mean, think about the universe, how big it is. I mean, we just, we're just one galaxy, okay? Um, it takes our planet, our solar system to go around our galaxy every 280 billion years, okay? And inside this universe, I mean, this galaxy that we have, think about it, there are two, at least 200 billion planets, suns, whatever. And and the amount of life that's in that intersecting all across our, our galaxies is incredible. And we're on the outside. In other words, we aren't even close to the center of it because it's, you know, it moves out. Um, our particular arm of the our galaxy, they used to think that we were right on the outside of it. We're not. We're, we're inside that ring. We're in, we're yeah. in the sweet seat. Yeah. Have you been outside of the Milky Way? Yes. Yeah. All right. Um, now I'm curious, I wasn't going to ask this, but what, what about black holes? Have you ever visited a black hole? A black hole is not what you think it is. Yes, I know that's why I wanted to ask it, because I think this is important. It doesn't eternally <laughs> suck up the universe and send it nowhere, and there is no such thing as a wormhole. They do not exist. It's mathematically incorrect. It cannot exist. Uh, all physicists will tell you this is just a theory and it's actually a failed theory because as much as they've studied it and tried to prove it was real they've learned that it is not and they're just now starting to admit that um black holes do emit energy yes they crunch things up it's like a garbage disposal it takes matter in but then it shoots it back out it's what regenerates our galaxy and the universe as well every single galaxy has one and it's the cleanup crew <laughs> And matter is totally transmuted and spit back out to make new things over and over again. Our universe is never going to grow cold because of that. It, we're constantly recycling our own energy. It never goes away. Energy cannot 
not exist. Energy so will exist. Are you able to visit close to one or get as close as, as safe? Um, they have the ability, you know, I can remote view you. If I want to, if I, I wasn't on here right now, I could bring you up in my view and my, I have the ability psychically to pull you up and look at you. OK, I don't need to go within miles of that thing to see what it is. OK, they're not totally dark. Our optics are crappy. No, no offense. I, I just wondered if they take their ships and go zoom, zoom, zoom. Let's no. get the edge of a black hole. <laughs> no, we, we get within distance of it that we can visualize it. Yes, but uh, it's got a huge there's a you don't even want to get within striking distance of it. It'll suck you in. You don't. Know, if you're that small, it'll take you real quick. And there's if, many of them in each galaxy, right? It's not just one at the same. Every single galaxy in our universe has one. Sometimes they have two or three. Um, Andromeda's got a bunch. Okay. Well, I was going to say. I mean, it's they're yeah. not super rare, are they? No, they're not rare at all. It's all it's right. how our universe exists. It's how it cleans itself up. It retransmutes energy into some other thing, and it shoots the particles of form back out so that they can re conglomerate together and make new things. It's a, it's the first part of what a star nursery becomes. So. Right. Yeah. Another couple of things I wanted to touch on because we've been talking for not quite an hour yet, but I really wanted to get to these because it's so cool. Okay. Uh, which is, you know, we sent out the Voyager probe with a little mm. gold record and all our information on it. Yeah, and I've got two of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Voyager one and two. Um, so you had the opportunity to actually see these up close from, yeah. from inside yeah. of a craft looking out at it. Is that right? Yep. Sure did. Very cool. Um, <laughs> uh, they are uh, not that big. I mean, they're bigger than me. You know, they're, I don't know, they're, they're pretty damn big, but not that big, okay? And they're fragile as all get out. And uh, ET is very proud of us for this that we built something that has taken a lot of hits, okay? That it's held up, especially at systems. It's amazing how well they've done, okay? And what they've been able to transmit back. And I will tell you the truth about this. ET a couple times have intervened because uh, we lost contact and recently and they've got it back again and they kind of helped facilitate that a little bit. They've They've helped it along. They can't actually interfere with it, but they've done some things that kind of help them keep going. Uh, they find it fascinating what we put on the side of it. You know, uh, Carl Sagan was a brilliant guy, and uh, he actually there was an encoded uh, me same message for a computer language as the disk. You know, where we are, who we are, what where our, our, what planet we are, our configuration and our solar system and everything. And they did shoot a message back and uh, we got it. And not a lot of people know the truth of that. You know, I think it was out there. I saw it once. I mean, I eyeballed it. I saw it on the, in the news a couple of times. Uh, it actually had the face, what they look like. You know, we had like a little stick figure, man and woman kind of thing. And well, man. And they sent one back with their face pretty well generated. And then they backed it up. They did a... Uh, uh, what do they call those things where you go in the field and you mush the grass down? Crop circles? They did one. They did a crop circle just like it. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. I've never seen that one. Yeah. So they're, you know, one upping themselves, trying to let us know that this is really happening. And uh, little people poop it. And the government's trying to make you think we're all nuts for thinking this stuff. And it's wrong. It's real. You know, they answer. So the ETs have taken you out for all these scientific expeditions to other planets and star systems and yes. looking at eclipses and planets yeah. going, you know, stars going over. Yeah. We had a huge event here in our solar system when comet Schumacher-Levy yeah. um, struck Jupiter. And boy, right. astronomers excited when this happened because nobody knew how this was going to affect Jupiter. And it right. ended up having a much more profound effect than right. one had thought. But you yeah. have opportunity to actually get a first hand front row right, <laughs> yeah. view of this. Is that right? Right. right. I knew, well, I knew it wasn't going to go in a solid object. OK, uh, there were uh, two of them or three of them. I can't remember what the two or three. 
it was a big thing and it broke up into three first oh. and then as as the gravity of jupiter started tearing it apart it went into seven pieces and then they started striking and you know the planets turning so they went boom 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 like that and we got to see you know going in that kind of gas that hot it would just explode in an incredible hot heat fire i mean nova fire just oh. about well, back was, up a second can you describe what it was like? I mean, we're, you were sitting on a craft, right? You were looking yes. through the view. What is that? How close were you? I and mean, can you just kind of walk us through that experience? Um, well, we were uh, totally transparent. So we had bird's eye view and everybody on the craft got to see it. Everybody was pretty much in the front facing part of it because they wanted to get as close to what they could see. They and we were optically above, a little bit above, because it's harder for us here on the ground here to see us when we're circling another planet. We have to play with uh, what we know about our optics and how we see things in space from our telescopes and stuff like that. So they had to position where we wouldn't see they wouldn't see us. In other words, humanity here wouldn't see them. I have to get my vernacular straight because I'm talking from the other side of this fence. <laughs> <laughs> we had to be stealthy about it. Okay, that's the best word I can use, stealthy about it, because we were damn close. We were in orbit and we were damn close and we were watching. And uh, it was it was unbelievable. The amount of information that they got from that alone was incredible. It tells you all kinds of things about the composite of the gases on that gas giant and how thick their atmosphere is and everything. I mean, even NASA learned tons from watching that. I mean, they've learned a lot about Jupiter and its composition because of that. And they were up to the same thing. They wanted to know, you know, it's very cool. Yeah, that must have been something to see. <laughs> yeah, the spectrometers were off the dials. I'm not kidding. It was cool. Oh, that's very cool. Well, that's, I think we've skimmed the surface of your actual experiences, you know, with flitting around the universe. Yeah, I covered this in the book, chapters called Dolly Among the Stars, because, I mean, man, that is just, yeah. uh, just Lucky. incredible adventure. It is, um, it is. And, I, feel, I, 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 I feel like I've lived 25 lifetimes in my one life so far, you know? It's never stops. I, I want you all to realize something that everything that I've learned, you're learnable to this. You can learn this. You can experience the same things that I have. And that's why I came forward because I don't like being alone here with this. I don't like being the only one who could talk about it. I don't like the fact that um, there are so many intelligent people on this planet and they're not giving it up to everybody else and not including and in being inclusive and encouraging and we're we're not using our innate abilities here and we need to we need to and et wants us to they want us to evolve up to this it's important yeah i want to yeah. talk about that in a future interview with you about you know the et's message to all humanity but i just recalled one other planet you went to <laughs> which we didn't cover which was right after you learned i think you flew for the first time on your own you popped out at a giant purple blue gas giant is that yeah. Right? yeah, that was pretty, pretty, pretty unbelievably cool. <laughs> um, it is. Have you ever wondered what a how long a neutron star or a quasar lives? Have you ever thought about that? Has anybody ever calculated how much energy this thing has and what happens at the end of its cycle? Because it will not go on forever like that. It will burn out. Right. And I was witnessing that actual occurrence in other words i was looking at the end of a neutron star's life and it was evaporating all its energy finally and there are examples of that throughout the universe it's possible and we have one close to us enough that we can visualize it with the new telescope we have they can see it and i've seen this one so that's a big give ya <laughs> everybody because that's I mean nobody ever talks about that and it bothers me every all energy exhausts itself eventually everything has a life cycle including neutron stars including quasars and what happens to them when they're done they don't just go they have a form a, a body of sorts and they glow different colors and you can see them particularly you know particularly 
drifting away from themselves. You know, they go off. Where do where do all those particles go? Where do all those elements go? What's happening? What's it feeding into? You have to ask yourself these questions. I mean, it's really freaking cool. And yeah, I got to see one. Very cool. All right, well, we've gone for an hour. I'm sure we could talk for another hour easily, but I did want to give you the opportunity to you know, cover anything that we didn't in terms of yeah. you know, visiting other places, other worlds. Because uh, yeah. uh, I mean, I don't want to skip anything that would be really cool. So do you have anything that you want to add to what we've already talked about? Um, look up, get a telescope, start thinking about what's going on around you um, get binoculars, <laughs> get 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 a rake and a fork and a shovel and start cleaning up your environment. Uh, learn to live sustainably. Um, do everything you can to be a healthy, happy, interested individual. You know, learn to use your abilities. You got all kinds of things you could be doing rather than sitting around talking about who did what yesterday with who. You know, I mean, it's just way more fun, interesting things to do than that. Way <laughs> more, you know? Yes. Well, you've certainly lived an interesting life and still are. So it's very, very cool. I'm yep. really honored and delighted that uh, you. you've shared your story with us. That's really quite a pleasure. And uh, I want to thank you, Dolly, for coming on and sharing your story with all the people of Earth. <laughs> Welcome. My honor. Thank you for letting me. I right. appreciate it. You got it. I want to do it again because there's more to talk about. <laughs> okay. All right, guys. Well, that's our show for tonight. I hope you've enjoyed it. Again, this is part four interview with a fully conscious contactee, Planets I Have Seen. And uh, yes, it's amazing how much stuff is out there. And we did cover a lot of this in our book, Symmetry A True UFO Adventure. So you can cover a lot more in a book than you can in an hour long podcast. So if you're interested in checking that out, I'm sure you'll find it interesting. And yeah, Dolly, I definitely want to have you back on again because there's some very cool stuff we still haven't talked about. So there will be a part five and part six and possibly more <laughs> coming ahead. So till then, thanks again, Dolly. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> All right. That's our show for today, guys. Thanks so much for watching. I truly appreciate it. And until next time, keep searching for answers. Keep looking for the truth. And above all, as I love to say, because it's important, keep having fun. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>